to my fifth interview in the Collaborate to Zero series where I'm interviewing inspirational leaders who can help share some of their thoughts and work that they're doing so that all of us can get to net zero quicker, faster, and it's all about collaboration. In today's interview, I've got Richard Dunn, one of the most inspirational educators I have ever met and is an absolute rock star when it comes to pushing sustainability and getting sustainability into the hearts and minds of the next generation and our future leaders. There he is. Good afternoon, Mark. Mr. Dunn, so good to see you again. And great to be with you. Thank you very much for joining the Collaborate to Zero. I'm so excited about this conversation. I was just saying that when we first met, I got summoned to your office as the headmaster to <laughs> be to be grilled by your, your eco-warriors. And uh, their inspiration has lived long in our business. And I am now the proud owner of a 10 meter high, 10 meter wide, turtle made out of 100% recycled <laughs> plastic, which is called Tim the Turtle, which was inspired in your, in your office. The, the, the other interesting thing, um, which I should share, which again has stuck with me forever, was when you told me you took the, the kids in your school to Chamonix and you asked them to put their hands on the glacier and look at the water running between their, their, their feet and said, here is climate change and global warming, which was just one of the most remarkable ways of teaching you know, real life uh, behavior and awareness. So yeah, I, they were very, very special trips, very special trips indeed. I, I've, I've got lots and lots and lots of questions. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you're going to, um, I mean, you will no doubt inspire for sure. But my, my uh, kind of slight concern when I when I asked my the, the head the headmistress of my girls' previous school and I said, Oh my god, you have the hardest job in the world. Education is changing by the second all around us. What do you think? And she looked at me blankly. I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so, Mr. Dunn, please tell me, let us know a little bit about the Harmony Project and the work that you're doing. Well, I think that response is quite a common response. And I was talking to someone uh, in a school overseas last week, and he was most concerned that he thought his education system hadn't really changed for 40 years since he was a child and in school. Uh, so there is that side to it. But of course, on the other side, there are a lot of people now, parents particularly, who are saying we need a different model. We need to do things differently. We need it to be much more relevant and meaningful and holistic and joined up in its thinking. And it needs to be addressing the issues of our time. So there is a movement to try and change that. I think the biggest challenge and what we see in the Harmony Project is that you've kind of got a juggernaut of education going in one direction and you're trying to sort of jump on board um, you know, a little bit like a team from Greenpeace to try and say, actually, we need to be steering this in a, in a different direction, because if we ha carry on in this direction, we're going to be heading to a not good place. So I think the challenge of what the Harmony Project is trying to do is to say, let's look at what you're doing already and let's rethink it and rework it. So it starts to address much more of the, as I say, the challenges of our time. So. If I give you a simple example, if we look at climate change, climate change is a massive agenda. And for a lot of young people, it's quite scary. But if you link it to, say, the Arctic or the Antarctic and ice melts, as we were just talking just now, and you start to get them to think about how our climate is changing and then what they can do about it, all the stuff that you had conversations about when you came to the school, then I think they feel good. So it's about working alongside schools and saying to them, let's rethink education with a really strong sustainability theme running through it. And let's uh, make it better through that approach. So it, it, inspiring with a positive message and kind of a feel good factor, which kind of makes sense is, is, is where we, we need them to be because there is, there's a lot of positiveness that we can get out of this. We just need to, we need to showcase that. 
Okay. I think so. Yeah. And I think the best way to do that is to, again, referencing your visits to the school, is to shift the focus away from the potential eco anxiety around climate change, for example, to something that they can do. So if you look at that in the context of energy manage management and monitoring in your school, suddenly students feel like they have a role to play. Uh, and then they take that message home and they start to ask their parents about, you know, where they use energy and how they can change that. So you flipped it on its head in quite a simple way and it starts to have an impact. It's a participation. I think participation learning is, 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 a, is a brilliant way of, of doing that. I know you did it incredibly well where you, you, did, you were measuring all the food and then you had the composter and then the composter fed the grass and everything else that, that, that worked. Uh, and I mean, the, the inspiration through the school was amazing. So are you seeing, is there a shift? Is there more urgency? Are more schools waking up to this? Do you see the curriculum changing? Is the government on board? So I think we've obviously been through a hugely challenging time over the last year to 18 months. And on one side, that has made people rethink what education is about. And a lot of, again, parents have seen how schools are working because they've seen it much more in their own homes. And it's opened up a conversation around, you know, how do we want our children's education to be? Alongside that, a lot of people have been much more connected to nature. So there's a very strong kind of nature element to it. But then the other side, of course, is managing all of the challenges of COVID and lockdown and, um, and the pandemic. And, um, and that's been really difficult. So I think we have to be careful not to be sort of pushing this agenda too hard when everyone's kind of on their knees at the moment in education, trying to you know, get everyone to the end of the year. But in a positive way, there are people saying this is a chance for us to do things in a different way. And my hope is if you take something like the Dasgupta report and review on the, bio, the economics of biodiversity, the very clear message in that report was the, ec the economy has got to put nature at the heart of all its practice. We've got to really think about how we do things in the context of what its impact will be on the natural world. Now, if that's a big message coming through in the economy, then education needs to be aligned to that. So I would be um, presenting the case that our understanding of nature should be at the heart of all our learning. We're very good, I think, at learning about nature. We're increasingly seeing the value of learning in nature. But I would say we need to go further and learn from nature. What are the principles, what I call principles of harmony in an educational context, that we can learn from? So things that you are applying to your business, cycles and recycling and producing your bottles out of 100% recycled material. That's the way that we want our young people to think. So I think we've got this really interesting element of learning from nature and these principles that create sustainable systems. And I, I love the, the, the Harmony principles. And I was, a long time ago, again, you very kindly gave me a spare copy of the Harmony book uh, written by the Prince of Wales, uh, which I have shared prodigiously around and told him to, to, to look at it. It is, it is stunning. But are we... How how can we get those principles embedded into into education? I mean, where my girls go to school now again, it's it you know, the eco clubs are are not they're not where they should be. They should be the cool clubs. They should be the clubs that everybody wants to be a member of. Versus, you know, it's just a oh, I'm not going to play sport on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, what do you think are the, the barriers are to to getting those those core principles embedded? Well, we, we've still got a very strong standards agenda and testing agenda. And I don't have a problem with assessment of learning or evaluation of learning. I would love to see children creating portfolios of work through their school journey that highlights the brilliant work they do around projects that really interest them. So to, to see that assessment might be an ongoing process to support a way of learning um, but 
actually the goal of the learning is much more meaningful than that. So I think what we have to do is, is at all levels push for that change. So let me give you a, a couple of examples. One of the things I'm doing at the moment is to work with the Forest School Association and others around what's called a nature premium, which is to ensure that all young people have access to nature-based outdoor learning on a regular basis. Now, that in some schools will be very natural because they'll do it anyway. And in other schools, it will be a big change. So there needs to be funding to support that change, to support the training, to support the running of sessions outside, to, to shift learning from, you know, this idea that you only learn in a classroom, which is really absolute rubbish, uh, to learning, learning out in the world, which is often where we get our best learning. So how do we get a better balance between classroom-based learning and outdoor learning? So that's a policy change. That's something that we're pushing at a government level to say you've done it for sport, so now let's do it for nature. Um, I think on the other side, yeah, it's quite a slow process. I think you have to hand, hand hold and say, let me show you how you can get to this different way of learning. And here are the steps along the way, and we'll help you on that journey so that you feel reassured, because we all know that if we're not confident in something, we won't sustain it. We'll just try and avoid doing it. Um, so how do we get, get them to take it on board and then run with it? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I mean, my ideal would be that these principles of harmony run through the curriculum, um, the national curriculum. In fact, I'm even starting to term it the natural curriculum. I think we need to move away from a national to a natural curriculum. So, yeah, so there, there are ways of doing it, but it's really at all levels. I think we need to look at the change. I, I, I shudder to, to think what the statistic is of the percentage of time or the amount of time that kids spend outside in outdoor learning. I suspect it's woefully low. Um, I, I suspect. One of the things that we, we talked about um, all those years ago where you mentioned the, the younger generation get the environment piece. They're closer to it. They have their hands in the mud and they kind of, they kind of get it. And then as they go off to secondary school, it becomes, it becomes less of a thing and other stuff becomes cooler. Are you seeing that, that, that interest in the environment and, you know, the surroundings, is extending into the, into secondary school and, and into university? Less so. I think it tends to be more holistic and more joined up as a way of seeing learning in primary. And as you say, you know, children generally at that stage are, are very keen to engage with projects that address those kind of issues. Secondary school, of course, is a different format. You know, you, you mainly are working with subject specific areas, different teachers, departments of learning and I think that more siloed approach does make it very difficult and you know it's not a criticism it's just a reality of what's happening so really if we're going to make it work more at secondary I think we have to try and uh, and reframe the learning more around projects that needs some creative thinking that needs buy-in from teachers and of course um, there are lots of issues to address through that process um, my, my sense is that a lot of young people, and if you look at organizations like Teach the Future, uh, they are very keen to push a, an interdisciplinary way of learning around projects. So they want to see their learning much more that way. And so I think it, you know, it's moving in the right direction because if young people start demanding it more and more, then it will need to be acknowledged in some way. It might not be the whole time, but it might be more around you know maybe themed weeks or certain elements within the curriculum that are much more flexible around this kind of approach that's a good idea themed weeks um because it makes it real it makes it real um i i i was asked to give a talk a few weeks ago at a school and i was amazed they had over a hundred people in their green club across or in the seniors in the senior school and uh, from year sevens to to six formers and i i i, I called a, a youngster out 
Uh, and I gave him my, my iPhone and the calculator and I said, I was rubbish at maths at school, um, but here's a, I didn't have a calculator. You've got a calculator. Here you go. And I, I worked through the carbon footprint of brushing your teeth and leaving the tap on for, uh, for two minutes and it completely shocked everybody at just how much carbon <laughs> we use brushing our teeth if you don't turn the tap off and then you times it by the school and you times it by households in the UK and you get the most stunning number and the, bear, the teachers often went, we need to use more you know, environmentally based uh, topics to discuss these subjects so that these guys kind of get it because they, 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 they get that piece better. Um, I'm interested to learn about the, the Sustainable Food Trust. Their website's amazing. They've got unbelievable um, you know, links through. Tell me more about them. So the Sustainable Food Trust is looking to transition food and farming to a more sustainable way of working. And they have created what's called a harmonized sustainability metrics, uh, which is a, a tool, if you like, to enable farmers and people growing food to measure their impact in terms of both environmental and, and social measures um, and to see how they can improve their work. So what's really good about it, what's really effective about it is that it's you're on a spectrum. So you may start in a particular strand looking at, for example, soil health. You may not be in a very good place there, but there are steps that can guide you to creating healthier soil or improving your biodiversity or looking at the social element of you know how the well-being of your staff for example so there are lots of different strands to the work and each strand takes you on a journey so you never feel like you kind of you're either on on board or you're not you feel like it's a, a constant evaluative process of moving towards a more sustainable regenerative way of working I think what's exciting now for the Sustainable Food Trust is that a lot of people are really interested in it. Uh, you know, the Prince of Wales is talking about it um, and, and highlighting the benefits of this approach. You've got uh, supermarkets, banks, uh, and people involved in the food and farming world who are saying, yeah, this is a really helpful way of us seeing how we can move to a better place. And of course, you know, you've got the rewilding element and the land sharing versus land sparing but ultimately we need to be looking at ways of um, growing food that is both good for us and good for the the planet rewilding I mean, and and offsetting I, I have i'm a massive fan of rewilding i think it's great and i i under the umbrella of the the Stella food trust do you think that the government should be supporting farmers slash landowners to to rewild more land? I think the government needs to be incentivizing practices that are helping to regenerate land. And rewilding is a part of that. Um, but, you know, coming back to the land sharing, land sparing, it's quite funny if you look at the land, um, the land sparing approach, because you could have a field that is really very industrially farmed it's got a lot of chemicals, nitrogen fixing, fertilizer sprays on it. But the land at the side might be a little bit wider and be spared of that and may have a certain amount of biodiversity. I, my sense of it and what I understand from the Sustainable Food Trust is we actually also may need to be looking at the, the farmland itself. So the technologies that can help us to do that more and they are coming will be really key to not just seeing it as the, the bit on the side, but how can we ensure that, you know, the farmland itself is, is healthy and, and good for, for wildlife? Yeah, I mean, it's so important to, to link them all together. I think it's, I have a slight bugbear with, with carbon offsetting. My view is that we need to do everything we possibly can and lean into reducing our carbon as much as possible. And then you start offsetting. You know, it's not a it's not something that you can buy to clear your conscience. It's something you need to do at the end. Um, and planting trees isn't the, you know, that's not necessarily the answer, but the, the rewilding piece I think is absolutely critical and getting the biodiversity up. Um, yeah, I so, mean, the statistics, as you know, the statistics are really shocking. I, I think I read at the end of last year in the WWF report that we'd lost 
68% of our biodiversity in the last 50 years. I mean, that's an extraordinary figure. I was talking to a school on Friday. I said to them, do you know how many different varieties or species of beetle there are in the UK? And uh, one very bright boy said, 3,200. Well, I think, the, I think the figure is closer to 4,000. Oh, wow. That's just beetles. And yet, I don't know about you, I could probably name three. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I couldn't name one. I, mean, I suppose uh, I probably could if I thought about it. Um, but, and, and again, it's, using, it's probably using that in a maths equation to go, well, if, you know, beetles, and here are beetles, and let's, let's make, it, make it visual um, versus incredibly dull and boring. Um, some of the partnerships that you're working with, some of the, the leaders that you've worked with, what, what, what's working well and, and what can, can you share from a, a collaboration perspective kind of outside what you do? Yeah, I mean, I think collaboration, as we know, is so essential now. We have to not see each other in competition with other organizations doing similar work. We need to work together. So... Uh, I mentioned the Forest School Association and our work yeah. on the Nature Premium. Uh, I'm doing a lot of work with the Eden Project and Eden Project International. And that's fascinating. I mean, Tim Smith's such a visionary man. And, you know, he's rightly so. He's really keen to see how we can push forward these urgent issues and, and really address them. So we're doing some really interesting work there, both in the UK, developing curriculum material, but also looking, and we've got a lovely project at the moment with young people on home. What's, what's my home? Where is my home? What are my hopes and fears for the future? And what would I say to someone who visits my home? So the first group of students we're working with, of course, we're doing this all online, is a group in the Maldives. Now, their home is hugely under threat and they are very conscious of that. And they're absolutely brilliant at sharing their message. So what we want to do is to build a network of young people sharing their story about their hopes and fears for the future and how they think we need to address the issue of home. And of course, it's got the environmental side, but it may have a social dimension as well. So the Eden Project is a great, a great example of that. And then the Prince's Foundation, we're doing some interesting work with. Um, and of course, this whole area of if, if you take Wales and the Future Generations Act, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, that's a very interesting area. And Lord John Bird here in, the, um, uh, in England and uh, linked to a similar bill on future generations, um, Lord John Bird, who set up the big issue. Uh, you know, he's pushing hard to really uh, get this whole idea of uh, an act that addresses the future, not just the now. And uh, I think we, we need to be much more forward thinking as well as dealing with the here and now. We need to be looking long term at the impacts of the way we live. And uh, so all these projects are looking very much along those lines. Well, that is a lot of food for thought because I hadn't heard of the Future Generations Act and the fact that the Eden Project is working with people in the Maldives is is fascinating and I, I again I started to think I, I suspect that the the kids in the Maldives totally get climate change and they totally get sea level rises and you know if a, a 12 year old or a 10 year old gets it over there then a 12 year old 10 year old should get it over here um, and there's probably a massive disconnect and it's how do we link those together do you think do you think technology might be a possible assistance in this yeah I think so and I mean What's interesting in the Maldives, as an example, is that the students learning is very old fashioned. So it's very stilted, it's pretty dry, it's very class based. And what they see is a very different world. So they're kind of running their lives in parallel. On one side, they've got a formal education with exams and tests and so on. And on the other side, they're looking at the world around them and seeing how it's changing. So, yeah, we have got to use technology wisely. And I think the best way is this, this idea of connecting them together so that they inspire each other and they hear about each other's stories, the context of their world and what they're doing. And the more we can do that and, and give real purpose to what they're doing, I think the better. They need to own their learning. I think for me, that's the concern. If they don't own it, it just feels like it's being taught to them or at them. 
then they won't be engaged in the same way. I mean, that's hugely powerful. Can you imagine if you had a, like I'd say, a 12 year old in the Maldives patched through to a, a school in England saying, you know, this is my classroom and this is what I'm learning and this is why it's so critical. I mean, it'd be unbelievably powerful. Um, so connections is a big, a big word there. Um, I know this is a ridiculous question. But <laughs> if, you, if you had a magic wand in your world, what would you do? Uh, I would shift learning away from being separated out and I would make it coherent and cohesive. So I would join it together, basically. That doesn't mean to say you can't teach subject skills and knowledge, but what it does mean is that you do it because it's relevant to the project that you're doing. I remember talking to my, uh, one of my daughters about her learning uh, in maths, and they did the Fibonacci sequence of the Fibonacci spiral. Mm -hmm. And I said, did you draw the Fibonacci spiral? Because it's a spiral of nature. And she said, no, 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 we just did it as a mass sequence of numbers. I said, that's a shame because it's a really beautiful spiral that we see everywhere in the world. And um, I said, by the way, what are you doing in art? And she said, we're doing pop art. So I thought there's a really great connection here between the maths and the art where they could have really joined it together in a beautiful way. And actually there was no connection at all. So literally one lesson to the next. Uh, was a different world. So I think if I had a magic wand, it would be to bring learning together under projects that really have a sense of purpose and a sense of practical application. Amazing. Amazing. And, and, and I think there's so many, so many kids out there where if you actually make it real, I was, talking to, mm -hmm. I was talking to a youngster the other day and he said, well, I, well, studying was a waste of time because none of it made any sense to me. and It wasn't relevant. And only until he had left and got a job and then went, oh, actually, that whole thought process, if somebody just explained it to me while I was at school, would have made much more sense. And I think you know, bringing the coherence and, and cohesiveness together is, 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 you know, is, is brilliant. I know we, we're running out of time, so I've got a, a quickly a few, a few more questions. So... Favorite brands, what favorite brands do you think are inspiring and, and tell us? Well, of course, Delphi Seco. Oh. <laughs> Thank um, you for the plug, that wasn't the point. Uh, but yeah. but no, but in all seriousness, I think the way that you work and the dedication and commitment you have to the cause is exactly what we need to be looking at. I mean, I remember Robert Swan, the polar explorer, talking about the, the biggest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it and actually, so we have to be walking the talk on it and that's what you do I mean I love I love any organization that's trying to challenge the status quo um, you know organizations like North Face um, and all the great work they've done around environmental issues and and we're seeing more and more of them you know I think the whole issue of sourcing where does our stuff come from where does our food come from is it the right source are we happy with it you know the food culture now is really changing and people are really questioning how their food is being produced. So all those kind of conversations are a, a good thing. And I think brands are realizing that they have to be at the forefront of that, otherwise they're gonna be behind the curve. Brilliant. And and books and podcasts that you you think we should be listening to? Uh, obviously yours, because yours is fantastic. So <laughs> you know, right. uh, uh, um, a big shout out to you and your podcast. I'm very jealous on, on Apple nonetheless thank you um well i think yeah there are so many podcasts now aren't there and they're they're really great and i suppose the challenge for all of us is do we have time to listen to them um in terms of books i was thinking earlier there's um and in fact i've written down a couple um you may know of a guy called mike berners lee and he's written a really interesting book called How Bad Are Bananas, which is looking at the journey of our bananas from where they're grown to our homes. And he's done a number of books which are very environmentally aware and, and challenging, and they're great. Um, I'm also reading a really lovely book called The Well-Gardened Mind. And it's about the importance of gardening and nature connection to our well-being, particularly for people who are in situations of maybe trauma or, or depression or difficulty. 
So that's a lovely book. And I'll share one last one, which is a beautiful book called The Hidden Geometry of Flowers by a man called Keith Critchlow, who used to run the Prince's School of Traditional Arts. And it's all about the amazing beauty and patterning and geometry of flowers. So that's a special book. Big asterisk next to that. Uh, brilliant, 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 brilliant. That is fascinating. Richard, so good to see you again. Thank you so much for your time and your inspiration. Um, as ever, I always come away from these conversations going, oh my God, there's so much more I need to learn. There's so much more <laughs> I need to do. So keep going and thank you for all your, for all your hard work. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, keep going with all your fantastic work too. Thanks, Richard. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.